Hi, I'm Colin Lacey, and I'm here to talk about Nats, specifically why, as a developer, I am extremely excited about using Nats. And the reason is that Nats solves communication. And when I say communication, I mean between servers, I mean between microservices. It could be communication from one microservice to a series of batch jobs, and then synchronizing those batch jobs to train a model. Synchronizing and stabilizing all that communication, it's not easy. We may take it for granted that, oh, we've solved service to service, batch sync, all that type of communication, but it takes a lot of work. So much so that the monolith approach is actually still pretty popular. When you have everything running in the same sandbox, well, getting them to talk to each other and learning where the faults are is pretty straightforward. But we know that over time, we might hit bottlenecks and resource challenges with monoliths, so we end up scaling and deploying our services separately. And microservices solve that problem, but they bring on the problem of communication. How do you get these services to communicate? At the very least, you're going to need additional infrastructure, load balancers, to balance and distribute traffic between your different deployments. And that's already, just right there, an infrastructure investment you're adding more overhead just to solve for communication. And that doesn't even get into all of the tooling we need, right? We're going to need additional tooling like service meshes for service discovery, load balancing, circuit breakers, all of the things that we need to handle the different fault cases that can pop up. We're going to need authorization and authentication tools. We're going to need trace logging and trace metrics to know which services are calling which, where is the additional load coming from, where are the errors happening. All these tools are required if you're going to run a successful fault tolerant microservice architecture. And I've got nothing against these tools. I use them. I've even contributed to some of these tools, but it does take additional work and knowledge to integrate, configure, and operate these tools successfully. So we're already looking at a lot of tooling and overhead just to solve microservice communication at the infrastructure level. From a developer point of view, we don't get the benefits of that. We write agnostic code. There is no calling an Istio method inside your Python code to say, hey, make a GET request to the service. No, we make HTTP requests and we're supposed to stay agnostic of the infrastructure. We're supposed to stay unaware of all of the tooling that we're supposedly benefiting from, right? Those benefits, they don't benefit the developer. They benefit the infrastructure, the platform engineers, the people running and operating our deployments. And all that, all that I've just described is only when you're deploying REST. Once you get into any of the other communications, gRPC or event-driven architecture, you have a whole separate tooling stack that you need to deploy and maintain. And with each one comes a set of trade-offs. So whether you're doing it in the code or you're doing it in your infrastructure, you're going to have pros and cons of each approach. And if you want to take a second approach, you need a second tooling stack to support it. So the overhead continues to grow as you experiment with different modes of communication. Nats, on the other hand, starts in the code. And the benefit of it starting in the code is we know exactly what's going on at the code level. We connect through a Nats SDK to a Nats server. And with that connection, we can see exactly what's going on. There's no blame game back and forth about, well, was the infrastructure configured right? Did we pass in the right environment variables? Was the code written incorrectly? Did the code not handle an error? We can see exactly what's going on based on our code interacting with NATS directly. So going back to the original statement, how does NATS solve communication? Well, first of all, discovery and load balancing is built in. We send messages to NATS on subjects and subscribers subscribe to those subjects and NATS distributes that load accordingly. And if those subscribers respond, NATS will distribute that message back to the source. So let's see that in action. Let's just take a look. I've got a Python file here and it's using the NATS SDK to connect to a NATS server, localhost 4222. And it's going to publish a range of numbers, one message for each number between zero and 10. And then I've got these subscribers that are listening on that same subject 
in a Q group. And this is how we load balance in NATS. We have subscribers listening as part of a Q group. And what they're going to do is they're going to exchange each number between zero and 10 for one of these letters and then print it out to the console. Pretty standard, not very fancy, but it's going to demonstrate how NATS distributes load. So if I pull up my console, I've got one subscriber. I'm going to start up right here. I've got another. I'll start that one up too, right? So right now I've got two subscribers running. I've got my NAT server, as I said before, listening on localhost 4222. And now I'm going to run my iterator. It published zero through nine, fantastic. And now let's look. The first subscriber got three, four, five, and eight. It exchanged it for D, E, F, and I, cool. The second subscriber, got the other numbers and exchange them for those corresponding letters. So we can see the traffic is distributed. So how does it do that? How does it distribute that load? Well, NATS has connection awareness. It knows what's listening and what's not. So when a message comes into a subject, NATS is going to say, okay, receive this message on this subject. Who's listening on this subject? If it finds a service that's subscribed, it's going to forward that message. Fantastic. Now, at this point, you might be thinking, well, that's just standard pub sub. That's nothing special. We've been doing it for years. Yes, but we're about to get really nuts because what NATS can do, NATS can handle responses. If that subscriber responds on that same subject, whoa, NATS is going to forward that response back to the original source. So we're not just talking standard pub sub. We're actually talking about transactional messaging. We want to see that in action. I want to see that in action. Let's look at what I've got here. I've got a Python file called request and reply. It's using, again, the NATS SDK. It's connecting to my local host server that's still running. And it's going to send messages to greet.joe, greet.sue, and greet.bob. And naturally, I've got a Joe, a Sue, and a Bob. And each one of them is listening on their corresponding subject. I'm going to come back down here into my terminal. Joe, start him up. Sue, make sure she's listening. And Bob. Here we go. They're all listening for messages on their individual subject. And the request response, it's going to send a message to each one and log the response that comes out. So I run this and I get a response from each one. That's awesome. Now you might've noticed with Bob, there's a try catch. Why is that there? Because it doesn't just stop with the happy path. Nats has built in fault awareness. If we send a message to a subject that doesn't have any listeners, right? Both of my listeners are down in this case. Nats is going to let us know there are no listeners active. You will not get a response. So let's see that in action. That's awesome. We're going to come back over here and we're going to shut down Bob. And we're going to expect this no responders error to be raised and we'll see this in the console. Okay. So I'm going to come back in over here to my request reply, clear that, run it again. And there it is. No response from Bob. So we know at the code level, that something went wrong and there are no responders. That's just like a 503 in REST, only without all the overhead of REST. How awesome is that? So from here, you might be wondering, okay, that's nice. What about some of the additional stuff that we need, like authorization? Yes, authorization is built in and it's super intuitive. You don't need ACLs. You don't need complex third-party authentication and authorization. It's built right in. So on the left, we can have a service that's authorized to publish to alerts.wildcard. That means alerts.anything else. On the right, we have a service that can only subscribe to alerts.hello. That's it. So we send a message to alerts.hello saying, hello there. And because they're both authorized, that message is going to go through. But if we send a message to alerts.bad or alerts.anything that isn't hello, well, the left side is authorized, but the right side isn't. So that message isn't going to go through. That's so intuitive and just makes a lot of sense that you're wondering, why hasn't it always been like this? And with that simplicity, 
with solving for communication, not solving for just rest, not solving for just events, but solving for communication holistically, you can build really complex systems at scale. You can build service to service. You can build pub sub. You can build model training. You can build batch processing. And what's cool, we barely scratched the surface. There are a ton of features we haven't even talked about. There's storage, there's durability, there's mirrors and mapping. There is so much more that we could talk about that makes Nats exciting for developers. And we will in future videos. Thanks for watching. And I hope this has been helpful.